Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and welcome to another episode of Living Divine Mercy. You know, this week is the week of October 13th, a very important day in the church calendar because of Mary's apparitions at Fatima. So in this program today, we're going to talk to you about the connection between Fatima and Divine Mercy. So please stay with us. You know, most people would agree that Fatima is about private revelation and prophecy. But if Catholics are not technically required to believe in private revelation, why listen? Well, mainly because even after Scripture was written and canonized, God didn't stop talking to his people. He still communicates with us, and especially he does it through the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas said that private revelation offers a deeper understanding of revealed truths and gives guidance of the actions we should take for a given time in human history. You know, the Bible itself says that not all things are in the Bible. So that's why God gives us the church and church-approved private revelation to help us get through the difficult times we live in in the present day. But remember, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI told us that prophecy is not set in stone. It is a warning for us to change, to avoid chastisement by following God's directives. So what was the private revelation given at Fatima, Portugal in 1917? Well, it happened during a time of great unrest. Surprisingly, maybe even more than today, World War I was raging, Masonic bankers were taking control of the world's banking institutions, especially in Russia, and Margaret Sanger, the founder of Plant Parenthood, released the film Birth Control, even spending some time in jail because it was so scandalous for the time. Now, discouraged by the state of the world, kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? Pope Benedict XV, the Pope at the time, did a novena to Mary, the Mother of Mercy, for peace. And on the eighth day of that novena, which was May 13th, 1917, God answered. Mary began appearing in Fatima. And also, back in Rome on that same day, Pope Pius XII, who later led us through World War II, was made a bishop in the Sistine Chapel. And later in that same year, St. Maximilian Kolbe in Poland began the Mission Immaculata. So around the world, where sin abounds, God's grace abounds all the more. So, what some people, however, don't know is that the message of Fatima actually began the year before, in 1916, when the Angel of Peace appeared to the children to prepare them for Mary's visits. The angel gave a prayer similar to the Divine Mercy Chaplet, saying, I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. You know, then Mary came on May 13th, which in 1917 was the feast of Our Lady of the Eucharist. So it's all connected. A lady, they said, more brilliant than the sun, appeared to Lucia, who was 10, Francisco, who was 8, and Jacinta, who was 7. And she asked for mankind to do prayer and penance and to never offend God again. Mary said mankind must abandon itself to God, the source of love and mercy. And she instructed the children to pray the rosary every day in order to obtain peace for the world and an end to the war. She told them to come back on the 13th of each month for six consecutive months. And she gave the children a secret in three parts. The first two parts of the secret refer to a vision of hell, devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, war, and the ears of Russia. And Mary said, to prevent this, I shall ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and 
for the communion of reparation on the five first Saturdays. So here's the thing. A lot of people say, well, we haven't seen the conversion of Russia and peace in the world, so therefore the consecration must not have happened yet. Well, here's the point. Mary asked for two things, not just the consecration of Russia, but the five first Saturdays. She said, if my requests are heeded, I will, or she said, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she said, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia. She will be converted and a period of peace will be granted to the world. Okay, so that's the first two parts of the secret. The third part prophesied persecution of the church, the Holy Father, and persecution of religious. Wow, we have seen a lot of that. Now, in that vision, that third secret, a bishop in white was seen with a halting step. What does that mean? Well, kind of like a limp. Now, remember, John Paul II had Parkinson's disease, so in a way he did have a halting step or a limp. And in that vision, the bishop in white was shot. Mary then, after that vision, promised a great miracle on October the 13th in 1917 for all to see and believe her words. So when that day came, the miracle of the sun occurred, with the sun dancing and spinning in the sky and then appearing to come crashing down to the earth. You know, people screamed, they repented, and they cried out for God's mercy. Then suddenly it all stopped. And all 70,000 who were present, who were wet and muddy from the rains, were instantly clean. So all was good, right? Well, not necessarily. World War II still happened, and Mary's predictions of hunger and persecution of the church also occurred. And even the children, they really suffered. Francisco ended up dying of the Spanish flu, and Jacinta um, had two ribs removed because of an inflamed lung without any anesthesia, and she died as well. Now, Lucia, she survived and later entered a convent, but she suffered. You know, in 1925, Jesus appeared to her, to Lucia, and described how Mary was so hurt by the blasphemies against her Immaculate Heart. The Blessed Virgin then requested these five First Saturday devotions to make reparation for these blasphemies. Now, remember, Mary, as I said, gave two requests before peace and the conversion of Russia could happen. The consecration of Russia and the first five Saturdays, the second request. Now, whether or not you believe the consecration of Russia has happened or not, it doesn't matter if we don't fulfill her second request of these five first Saturdays. We need them both. So maybe that's why we haven't seen fully the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and peace in the world, because we haven't been faithful to what Mary requested of us every first Saturday. Now, if you haven't, please join us, Mary and Fathers, every first Saturday at 11 o'clock Eastern Time in the United States, but you can view it around the world on our Divine Mercy YouTube channel as we lead you through exactly what to do to fulfill Mary's request. We also have it on our Facebook page. So now, what's happening? Okay, later then, in 1981, on May 13th, God gave us a wake-up call. John Paul II was shot, and while in the hospital, he asked for only two things. The secret, the third secret of Fatima and the diary of St. Faustina. He saw his shooting as the fulfillment of the shooting of that bishop in white. Now, he didn't die because, remember, as we said, prophecy is not necessarily set in stone, but given as a warning. So now, after he read the third secret, John Paul II said that Mary was no longer to remain in the background. John Paul II, he began to make explicit the connection between Fatima and divine mercy. In fact, Fatima even began and ended with mercy. The angel's words in 1916 in the beginning were, quote, designs of mercy. And Sister Lucia's last vision, she was given the words, grace and mercy. 
So John Paul II says he finds hope in a love more powerful than evil, that what no sin of the world can overcome. This love, he says, is merciful love. And Mary brings us to the source of this love, her son Jesus. He said that consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we've all probably done the consecration of Mary, so important, 33 days of morning glory. He said consecration to the Immaculate Heart means bringing the world and all its problems to the pierced heart of the Savior. It means bringing the world through Mary to divine mercy. John Paul II said, the message of Fatima is more urgent than ever. It invites us to approach anew the fountain of mercy by an act of consecration. So Mary wishes to draw us near to this fountain, he said. That's why we Marian fathers, we focus on consecration of Mary or to Mary and divine mercy, the two spiritual weapons of our times. Thus, the end and goal of the message of Fatima is to bring us to God's mercy. And John Paul II said, we will see the completion of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart when man turns with trust to Jesus in prayer and penance for the sins of the world. You know, that's what the whole Divine Mercy Chaplet is all about. John Paul II realized there would be peace as heaven promised us through Fatima, but also through St. Faustina. So how do we bring the triumph of the Immaculate Heart about? Well, it's by doing this. Don't despair, trust. As we saw last week in our episode on St. Faustina, trust is the message of the diary, the Bible, and now even Fatima. As Father Mike Gately says, it is the second greatest story ever told. So as we await and pray for the complete conversion of Russia and the world in this time of mercy, we can call down a whole ocean of mercy upon ourselves and the whole world. That's what Divine Mercy is all about, especially Divine Mercy Sunday. So this is the final message of Fatima and the way that we can prepare the world for the Lord's final coming. Through Marian Consecration and Divine Mercy Sunday, our soul will never be cleaner. And this is why the message of Fatima and Divine Mercy are so important. Now, to finish, one of the key things Mary asked us to do at Fatima was to pray the rosary. Now, let's see how one man is going above and beyond doing just that. I farmed all my life. When I finished my sophomore year in high school and my dad got sick, I just stayed home after that to help him farm. And then in 1963, I married my lovely wife and we began our own farming operation and lived on this place for 40 years. And my wife thought I would never leave the farm. But my hips got wore out and I couldn't get my work done anymore myself without relying on my boys to come to help. And they have their full-time job too, and I just couldn't get it done anymore alone, so I decided to retire. We moved down to the lake, and when I was on a farm, I was working really hard every day and go to bed and sleep at night, but I had not that physical part anymore, so I had problems with sleeping and developed anxiety problems. It, it scared me somewhat because I knew several farmers in the area that retired at 62 or 63, moved to Carroll. Within two years, they were gone. They had nothing to do. I, I prayed rosaries when I was farming, but I guess I didn't turn to the Lord that much at that time until this progressed along. I prayed a lot. I think my wife was wondering, what is he going to do next? How am I going to get him through these times? Because she felt so helpless, and I didn't know what to do until she asked me one day, do you think about ever making rosaries? And I said, no, my hands are way too big. I can't do that. So time went on. and. 
finally I gave in and she ordered me some beads and she had some pliers ready because she already made rosaries. And I guess because Donna suggested it and I'd give it a try. And once I tried it, I loved it. One rosary has 139 parts. I like to have my loops look like circles to keep them perfect. Ordinary mission rosary, I can make in an hour and 20 minutes to an hour and a half. And then I make a Jacob's Ladder rosary and that takes me two and a half hours. I have a lot of favorite rosaries, but the one that I love giving away is the Purgatory Rosary. The beads are black on the first mystery. By the time you get to the fifth mystery, they're clear white. You pray that soul that you're praying for has made it to heaven. But I've sent thousands around the country. I've sent some with a priest that is from Haiti, and he took them home. And when I talked to him after he got back from his home visit, he said the people come running out of the hills. Father, do you have any more rosaries? So that really brings a warmth to my heart that I'm doing something good to help people get closer to Jesus through Mary. One of my boys said, Dad, did you ever think about how far your rosaries would stretch if you unlooped it and stretched it out and hooked them all together? 7,650 rosaries, how far that would go. And I did a little calculating and it's 4.28 miles of continuous rosaries. It's a calling and a special ministry. It's not a hobby. I've had people ask me to make jewelry and I said, no, that's not what I want to do. I want to make rosaries. My rosary making, 99% of the rosaries that I make now, I use a Divine Mercy Center to promote the Divine Mercy. I guess I'm drawn to the Divine Mercy, first of all, because of all the mercy that God has for us. We really need God in our lives every hour of the day. The making rosaries and praying more, adoration, going to Mass every day, it makes me really want to help people draw closer to God through the Blessed Mother, through the rosary. My wife and I drew up our trust and we decided our home farm, which isn't a lot of acres, but we were going to donate all those acres to nonprofit organizations when we pass from this earth. Well, sister came along and was looking for some land and it was a perfect opportunity for us to help her to attain her dream. And we could see it develop in our lifetime, which is truly awesome. And she has a beautiful place here and it's not only us, it's other people in the community that are really stepping up to help her. When I pull onto this property, I sense peace that the Lord is present here in the Blessed Mother. Beautiful place to come to pray. As a farmer, we rely on God so much and really everybody on this earth relies on God in one way or another and we need to realize that. Life is something special, not to be just taken for granted. His mercy especially. God's goodness in my life is my life. We have six girls and three boys, 33 grandkids, and I think it's 21 great-grandchildren. God has truly been good to us. I just can't comprehend all the blessings he has granted upon our family. We've had our trials, we still have them, but his blessings outweigh all of those. I love fishing. When I lived on a farm, I couldn't fish because they bite corn planting time and corn harvest time. But now that I'm retired, I can do that at the lake. And we live real close to the water and I can go down to the lake and if they're not biting, I just go back up to the house. I learned day one of marriage, we need to listen to each other. And Donna's been a great inspiration to me. Her faith is probably deeper than mine.
Divine mercy means God is all merciful. He has more mercy for us than we can ever imagine. He loves us so much, and I love him. Thank you, Leon, very much for that awesome story about the rosary. And, you know, speaking of the power of the rosary, I remember when I first came to the Marian Fathers, one of the very first mothers that I ever met was Kathleen Roche, God rest her soul. And she used to tell me about all the rosaries that she used to pray for Marian priests and priests around the world. So I'd like to introduce you now to one of our Marian priests who is the fruit of of all the prayers of those rosaries. Well, that's a very interesting question. When I was in grammar school, I, I studied with the um, sisters who were founded by Mother Seton, and they were kind of connected with the Vincentians founded by St. Vincent, Vincent de Paul. So when I was in the seventh grade, I went to a uh, vocation camp that the uh, Vincentians had, and they were trying to get people to go to their um, minor seminary. But I wasn't ready for that. So I just went after a week, I, I decided to go to a regular Catholic high school on Staten Island. And then in, during high school, I started looking into uh, the Archdiocese of New York. I visited the vocation director, I visited the major seminary and the college seminary. But again, I said, I don't, I don't think I'm ready for that. My parents had visited Stockbridge, and so we had Marion Helper magazines. At that time, it was called the Marion Helper Bulletin in the house. So it's possible that subliminally, the Lord was working on me in that way, although I wasn't so aware of it. Um, but it was actually um, a ca an ad advertisement in Catholic Digest. I came from a large Catholic family, and I had been thinking about the diocesan priesthood, but I thought, man, it might be a little lonely to be uh, a diocesan priest. It might be better for me to be in a, in a religious community. It's more like a family. We pray together, we recreate together, we work together. So to me, I thought the perfect fit would be a religious community that has something to do with Mary. And then I looked in Catholic Digest and I found an advertisement for the Marians and I sent it in and that's how I found the Marians. Well, celebrating the sacraments, uh, celebrating Mass, hearing confessions, uh, anointing the sick, uh, it's a blessing to just be there uh, at, the, at the time of people's lives, baptisms, weddings. Uh, I even did a confirmation once when, uh, when I did an Easter vigil. So to, to take the place of Christ in, in the people's lives and they invite you into their lives at those important moments at the beginning and at the end of life, when they're uh, changing their life, getting married and things like that. It's just an awesome uh, grace to be able to be an instrument of grace to people at a, at a time like that. Well, you might remember Father Joe as being my co-host on Divine Mercy Sunday, and you also might remember him from the work he did on the series about Fatima back in the 100th anniversary in 2017. Now, one of the things that we always want to talk about when we discuss Fatima is the miracle of the sun that happened on October the 13th. Let's take a look in a little more detail about this miracle. So let's go to October 13th, 1917, and what's known as the Miracle of the Sun. Of course, any miracle is impressive, but I personally think that the Miracle of the Sun was one of the most awesome and dramatic public miracles in the whole history of the Church. During the July 13th apparition, Our Lady had told Lucia that she would perform a miracle in October for all to see and believe. While well, all morning long on the day of the promised miracle, a steady rain saturated the Cova de Iria, but despite that, tens of thousands of people still came. Then, at midday, Our Lady appeared, and the children knelt in the mud at the front of the crowds. Looking very sad, Our Lady said, Do not offend the Lord or God anymore, because He's already so much offended. After speaking those words, Mary opened her hands, and the reflection of her own glorious light was reflected on the sun as she disappeared into the distance. At that point, the children began to experience a series of visions, 
St. Joseph with the child Jesus, Our Lady robed in white with a blue mantle, and then Our Lady again, first appearing as Our Lady of Sorrows, and then as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Now while the children beheld those visions, the people who had gathered saw something very different. Suddenly the rain ceased, the clouds separated, and I saw a large sun brighter than the sun. Before the astonished eyes of the crowd, the sun trembled, made sudden incredible movements outside of all cosmic laws. The sun danced according to the typical expression of the people. Suddenly, the sun stopped spinning and returned to its place in the sky. Everyone started shouting, miracle, this is a miracle. Just then I noticed that both the ground and my clothes were bone dry. There was a man standing with his face turned to the sun. He recited the creed in a loud voice. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Wow, so why did Mary do the miracle of the sun? She did it so that people would believe her words. And what were the words of Mary at Fatima? Prayer and penance. And regarding prayer, specifically the rosary. Why do we pray the rosary? Because it's like the first part of the mass, liturgy of the word. It's meditation on scripture, not just a bunch of Hail Marys. The rosary is meditating on the very mysteries of the Bible. And also pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet because it's like the second part of the Mass, the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Why? Because the Liturgy of the Eucharist is about sacrifice. And what's the Divine Mercy Chaplet? It's about sacrifice. So until next week, meet us back again as we talk about this important attribute of God, the most important, His mercy. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.